Welcome back to the Nutra Medical Report. We're joined by Jonathan Gray. Literally, uh, you're the man from tomorrow. In fact, uh, when we talk about this today, you're a day closer than we are here to uh, December 21st, the so-called Mayan, I call it scam day. And we have modern Mayans that are trying to use this and hype it up. They have been for decades. Uh, I think to prepare the people for some changes that are totally man-made or opportunistic. Uh, and you've dealt with this in your book. We're also going to deal with the last bit of this today and then move on to your chapter in The Forbidden Secret, which is a major tome, a major ebook. That I think everybody should get both of these books. Uh, can you give us the title? And the website is before us, b e f o r e u s dot com, b e f o r e u s dot com, before us dot com. What are the titles of the 2012 book and also the the Forbidden Secret book? These are available uh, online. They can order them as ebooks. They can put them on their computer, their Kindle, their iPad, or even their iPhone, and they can read them. Um, they're quite remarkable in terms of their research. Uh, and you have many other books as well. They're great presents, by the way, to send people as an e-present, if you want to call it. Yeah, if any, anyone wants to uh, to find out where to get those books, they just scroll down the uh, bill to the bottom of the page, and on the right-hand side there's a link which says other products, and that will list them all with their details. Yeah, it really is amazing. And these are great, as I mentioned, e-books. Uh, they're e-presents. So... Um, Let's finish up with the 2012 issues. We talked about this last week uh, on the show. What are the key issues? Because we've dealt with some other experts. In fact, you did put up a 10, 11 minute, almost a 10 and a half, almost 11 minute uh, clip yesterday with Professor McCanny, and he's concerned that uh, there'll be a lot of these suicide cults that may even try to promote suicide on 2012, uh, December 21st. Um, I don't see, expect anything, quote, specifically to happen on that day by any means. Uh, but what I do expect is that the globalists are going to try to use dates like this or to dismiss, number one, prophetic fulfillment, or to dismiss real issues like space weather, nearest objects, and the danger of a coronal mass ejection like the Carrington event, so the public will not, quote, pay attention because they'll literally boo or uh, persecute people who even raise questions, or the people who actually talk about true prophetic fulfillment, which is not based on setting times or dates, but on the unveiling of signs, which is how the Bible was set up, that those signs are present, and as they unveil, they're going to make it very evident that these things are going to happen very soon. Yes. Uh, well, put very simply, on the winter solstice in 2012, uh, that's the northern hemisphere winter solstice where you are, Bill, the sun will be in the same alignment with the centre of the Milky Way uh, as it was in a past era. Uh, the Maya Long Count calendar marks the end of a 5,125-year era, and that's a fact. Um, and from this, some folk theorise that whatever energy typically streams to Earth from the centre of the Milky Way will be disrupted on December 21, which is Friday, this coming Friday. Uh, and the time uh, prophesied is 11, 11 p.m. 11 minutes past 11 p.m. universal time. Well, that's Greenwich Mean Time, just a few hours ahead of you. Yeah, so GMT would be, I think, that's in England. We're in the west coast of the U.S. I think GMT is about, uh, I think, seven hours ahead of here or eight hours. Something uh, like so, that. So that would be around 3 o'clock in the afternoon on, on uh, just as my show is getting ahead of... Uh, of steam on actually starting uh, in three oh, well, well, dinner time. Yeah, those theorists would, would, would yeah. then hypothesize, Bill, that um, your show will be the last show on Earth. Ah, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, because it'd be right around that time, actually, uh, around the, the third hour when it would actually, during our prepper hour, we called our preparedness, civil defense, martial law, and earth changes panel is on. So that, I think it's quite humorous. But we, the real issues we have. Everything from the spread of depleted uranium to the globalists trying to start a war in the Middle East uh, to uh, real issues like increasing volcanism and earthquakes that are happening and scientists that are showing a cooling period like the Maunder cycle that happens every 360 years is actually happening again. So at the very minimum, we're heading into a mini ice age. Uh, we have the use of genetically modified food, stacked vaccines, uh, global policies in terms of finance that are insane that are pushing us toward the brink of a, of a recession, depression. And we have globalists moving us into a matrix wanting to control the currency. So these are real issues. The big ones, are, you know, dealing with space, weather, etc. These are very real. 
and they need to be dealt with. In fact, Congress passed a law to harden the grid, which they were going to do in other countries like Australia and New Zealand. It needs to be done because the, the current grid technologically can't survive just even putting extra loads from wind power and other alternative energy sources like geothermal because it'll load the system with transient surges. It'll blow the power grid. Then you add CMEs, uh, coronal mass ejections, and other space weather, and it's not going to make it. The grid is going to, it's like an old tar paper shack. It's not going to survive the next two to five years. And that will crash civilization more surely than uh, a nuclear war. I mean, it's really going to be bad. Oh, yes. Uh, and I, I think that's more relevant to our future than any imagined uh, uh, day of doom or moment of cosmic shifting on December 21. And basically the fear-mongering by the globalists, because I think primarily what I see them doing is they're trying to create a fear state so they can get control of the population through Al-Qaeda and all these fears, like take off your shoes in the airport and don't have glass bottles of gel larger than so many ounces. All of this is a fear state to control the population because they want to herd us like farm animals uh, into a global matrix where all our money is biometric and, you know, real issues like the mark of the beast type system, a matrix type electronic money system that's based on biometrics. That's very real. That's not conspiracy theory. That's already happening. Like our money, even in New Zealand, Australia, and many countries, already has a chip in it that can be recognized up to 400 meters away. Uh, these are very real. We have a very grave danger of the grid going down or the end time distribu production distribution or major superquakes that cause all kinds of events happening. So there's a lot of stuff that could happen here that uh, people are just not prepared for, are they? Oh, no, they're, they're not. Um, and uh, we we have to be realistic. There, there are crises uh, all around us right now, and, and most people are not taking notice of them. But when something sensational comes along like this, so many people prick up their ears and they think, oh, this has to be, this has to be the big event of my life. Yeah, exactly. Um, so let's talk about the 2012 book that you put out, uh, which I think is pretty relevant. Um, what uh, what did you say that you think is particularly important for people to pay attention to? Because I see them trying to make sure that they mock anybody that talks about prophetic fulfillments or even just looking yeah. at the issues boldly with the science or even public documents that are already published by astrophysicists or power experts in the power grid or even things like cyber attacks. We know cyber terrorism is very real. Uh, we know even just extreme storms can knock out the power. Like in Sandy, three nuclear reactors in America lost their backup power systems, and if it had gone longer than two weeks, who we had critical reactions in those nuclear reactors? And people think this is the China syndrome isn't possible. I'm sorry to say, it's more possible now since Sendai, Japan, because we have more engineering faults that we recognize in identical systems. Yes. Well, um, I, I do agree that um, uh, you made a very interesting point just there, uh, and that was the first one in particular, but I agree with everything you've just said. But the first point you made was that uh, this can be used to discredit genuine prophecies that right. uh, tell what is coming. So there's been people say, oh, um, you know, like, um, <laughs> cry wolf, it didn't happen. So how do we know anything's going to happen? Yeah, in fact, I think there's a prophecy in the book, New Testament books that say that they shall mock and say, and every day shall proceed as it did before, and they shall be married and given in marriage, etc. In other words, the mockers are going to come saying, look, all this prophetic garbage is just overloading us, all the false prophecies, all the, you know, the major media beating the drums of Nostradamus and the, and the Mayans and the Hopis and all of these other ones, and misinterpreting things even that they said. I mean, if their experts have come forward and said, hey, no, that's just like January 1. Yeah, we're not predicting the end of the world. And then they take the Hopi, which have never set any dates. And then they take Nostradamus, who's using divination techniques to fight Moses, translated from an ancient book called the Ancient Book of the of, uh, of Mysteries from the Chaldeans. I mean, it is so bizarre that they push this stuff. And then they want to dismiss biblical prophecy, which is over and over again proven to actually be fulfilled. So let's continue on this line, and uh, hopefully we'll not have anything foolish happen like what I call 2012, December 21st, uh, mass suicides, which we're speaking against. We put up an 11-minute clip almost with Professor Kim McCann yesterday on live stream. Welcome back, and um, you've got a lo lot of really interesting topics in this book here. You talk about the Mayan culture and how uh, 
uh, they went through. And then, of course, it talks about the astronomical reality and the theories about 2012. Uh, let's touch on some of the more important issues here before we close off this and get into our the other book, the talking about the real issue of why Christmas is so important, which comes right down not just to the birth of Jesus, which is not correctly in Christmas, but more likely around tabernacles, but the resurrection, which really is a completely different uh, issue altogether. It's the reason for Christmas. It's not just the birth of Jesus, but the resurrection, which means basically human beings which are mortal becoming immortal beings. Uh, and we're not talking about just nanotechnology or biological senescence being wiped out, which is a good thing for some people to live hundreds of years. It's a, a completely beyond that thing. And um, so let's talk about some of the theories of 2012 and how you dispel these, because you went through some good historical analysis and how the biblical prophecies are smack on, but these other ones, they're always trying to intersect them and transect them and combine you know, the I Ching with uh, this guy from Hawaii that put this together and WebBot project and remote viewing and all these other, you know, what I call false prophets. This is very confusing to the public. A lot of people are going to go get panicky over it, and they shouldn't be. And when real issues come up, they should be pushing their congressmen to harden the grid uh, to make sure that they have three weeks of food and water and to get to higher ground if they're in danger of earthquakes or volcanoes and make sure the nuclear plants have got better safety procedures. I mean, those are concrete things people can do that can make sense so that they have food, water, and real basic simple protection and what are called the basic core prepper things that make sense to deal with, you know, moderate to large disasters. Yes. Well, um, I, I would like to mention that the events of history are not mercilessly set by fate. Um, rather, there are patterns in the events of human life and history that mock the idea uh, and almost shriek out the, the fact that a superior intelligence is behind world events. And uh, to a careful observer, the events of history can be seen as linked together, unfolding one by one in what you might call a complex but inevitable sequence as though pre-planned and pre-known. And, and I point this out to, to people as a power at work which is not of this world. Now, if this world is carried on of its own accord, without any reference to God, without a pilot, we should not be able to read the amazing pre-written prophecies that have been coming through right through history in the Bible. And as history progresses, various biblical prophecies have been fulfilling according to a pre-written time schedule. And some of these are so specific, Bill, as you know, they detail names and dates even. Right. And in these prophecies, the major events of history, stage by stage, are touched upon. And I'd like to point people to this. Um, and they lead up to a final, sudden interruption to human control of this planet. So as we look at history, do we see events step by step, move by move, obediently fulfilling these prophecies? Yes, we do. There's a hint of intention behind it. So we're not, we're not subject to merciless natural forces that we, we, we have to be in, in terror of, such as a, 12, a 2012 ending to history. Uh, the universe is not fated to destruction on its own. At this moment, we can turn to biblical prophecies which have been accurate, spot on. There's more than a thousand of them in the Bible. And I like to call the Bible the intelligence report because it's the best intelligence we can ever consult. Yeah, and it does it in a way that also doesn't assault your intellect. Uh, that's one of the things I like about the Bible because it's like an interlocking uh, set of very, very fancy tumblers and a very powerful, you know, giant safe lock, you know, that might be the size of, say, somebody in NORAD. Uh, and that lock, basically, if you listen to the, the tumblers clicking, you can realize, oh, this tumbler clicked. Uh, Palestine's been recognized by the United Nations. They've got the Oslo Accord. They're both to partition the state and the city. Oh, the Jews are both to start a sacrifice. They're calling for the rebuilding of the Herodian Temple. These things have never happened in 2,000 years. So we know when these signs are happening, when we see this war against Syria, when we see these things happening, we know we're really, really close. It's like if you get in a ship and it's very misty and there's a lot of fog. And as you get closer in the fog bank to the, to the shore and you can see the flashing lights of the lighthouse, you can see the workers ready to grab the ropes and pull the ship in. Um, we don't have to have confusion. That's why when it says no man knows the day or the hour, it's literally telling us to be watchful that when you see these signs happen, you'll not only know the day or the hour, you'll know the minute. 
but you won't know it in advance. You'll know it as it starts to be unveiled or apocalypsed or uh, revealed. So that's it why I like the word. Yes. Yeah, you'll recognize it because it'll make sense, uh, and, and you'll see a sequence. Now, what I was given and I given gave in clay and iron, which I'll be republishing next year. There's a number of keys, and I've been given some additional ones, including the small scroll prophecy. The the keys I was given is only one great superquake, not three or four. There's only one great war, not two or three different wars that's going to happen. There may be stuttering periods in between, like a false peace, but ultimately there's only one great war. Uh, there's only one great war of Gog and Magog. And when you start looking at these prophetic things, what I think that the, what I call the modern minds, the globalists, the bankers want to do by pushing all this Mayan garbage of Nostradamus and everything on these TV channels and books and so on, is to confuse people so they don't accept God. Even the people that are doing remote viewing, I got a call and an email to go to Ed Dames in, in Reno, Nevada, because I do all these different show interviews, to go for a private viewing, and they have to sign a non-disclosure to, for their so-called revealing of the kill shot, which I've been having and talking about this for years, long before Ed Dames talked about it, and talking about the fact that uh, even back in 1997, I was told by experts like Dr. Isley at the, and the U.S. Space Command in the mid-'90s they are concerned about a major CME knocking out power on the Earth, and that's why they're putting the upper atmospheric uh, nanoparticles at 73 to 80,000 feet of thorium, barium, and aluminum. It isn't just to re- change the albedo or the reflectivity of the Earth. It's to reflect a CME that will knock out the civilization as we know it. So uh, what happens is we have to not take God out of the equation. And what I see all these shows doing, whether it's the Hopi or the Mayans, they take God out of the equation and then take prophetic revelation, which isn't setting dates, but giving you specific signs to watch. If you're watchful, you'll know it's coming. You'll have advance notice before everyone else. You'll be like the sons of Issachar or the ancient prophets that were given specific signs to watch. And if they were watchful, they'd blow the shofar. They'd warn everybody else. That's what we're here for. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, and so what we're looking at here actually is um, a book we can depend on. It's, it's rejected or, or neglected by so many, but it, not one of its prophecies has failed, Bill. And I think this is the important message. It explains how to survive what is coming. It supplies evidence of an intelligence outside and above nature that has planned to intervene. It offers evidence that there is a direction, there is a purpose, even a theme to history. And this amazing book informs us as what we can expect as history approaches its end. And you've just been mentioning some of those things, and I, yeah. I totally agree because it, they're very plain there in black and white. Yeah, in fact, to tell people the three signs to watch, even if you're not, quote, religious, because that's why we're supposed to, the revelation is supposed to be a major tool for evangelism so that people who are unbelievers or people that have, you know, very, what I call, millimeter-thick faith will realize, like, we're preppers or they're not preppers or they're ignoring all the signs. They'll see, when they see us moving towards, say, the Mark of the Beast system and they see it being imposed by America on the world and they see a nation being crushed by a great beast system, NATO and the United States, they should see the fulfillment of prophecy literally in the news every day. We'll be back in a moment with more, but we can't take God out of the equation. But they didn't move. It's too beautiful. Too beautiful. I can only think of the enjoyment they've got. There you go. Welcome back, and um, yeah, that's an important principle. We're going to say one thing. Uh, firstly, nothing's going to happen on the 21st. Things will happen. A lot of them will be man-made or man-amplified. We have the uh, panic. Of course, the, the master of panic is the dark one, uh, Satan. Uh, we have governments that literally leap on disasters, including this, the, the Sandy Hook school disaster, when nobody asks the questions about parenting, proper locks on the on the on the. Uh, the things in about the polypharmacy that can take a child probably with Asperger syndrome and autism. And by the way, by themselves, it usually makes it very passive. It's these, I call, kill you jack drugs like serotonin reuptake inhibitors, antipsychotics, and anti seizure drugs that take away inhibitions. And that's why you see bizarre activity. Well, 
the same thing we, we I see the what I call the modern Mayans is trying to literally take out of the equation when the prophetic things from the Hopi and the whatever that's all confused doesn't happen this Friday they say see go back to sleep don't look at space weather don't ask questions about the power grid or safety of nuclear reactors and technology don't look about even stack vaccines and GMO food and depleted uranium penetrators that leave the entire countries loaded with depleted uranium dust that's kicked up every time they have a dust storm in the Middle East oh no no don't ask questions about any of this stuff don't ask questions about fluoridated water or about electronic and biometric currency or about printing money a lot of literally like there's no tomorrow which they want to make so they can buy up everything in a fire sale don't even look at prophecy where God is in the equation is the ultimate thing they're trying to do isn't it yeah that's right yeah that's amazing so uh, I think that wraps up I think we beat that issue hopefully to death enough there's a, a ten and a half minute clip there with Professor McKinney trying to impress on people don't commit suicide on Friday. That's my primary concern is that idiots will think some great catastrophe is happening. They're going to leap on the next comet and go into a different dimension and all this garbage. For God's sake, realize real disasters are coming and you got to prepare for those, but you need to, number one, have your Bible and you to, got to be ready to analyze things logically and prepare spiritually. Uh, let's change gears back into the uh, Forbidden Secret book. And what chapter are we up to in Forbidden chapter Secret? Chapter 35, Bill, and it was a few, I've got a few chapters on this uh, topic of the resurrection of Jesus because it's, yeah. it's a big one. Yeah, and we're going to continue this, by the way, on the day after. Right. We'll continue this in two weeks' time, right the day after New Year's on the 2nd of January uh, in our usual time slot, which is uh, 2 Pacific time, 4 Central and 5 Eastern on January 2nd. So uh, let's continue, because this is the real reason for Christmas. You know, the birth of Jesus, which probably occurred around Tabernacles, but the real reason for Jesus coming was to demonstrate and project and not only show his resurrection, but the promise of ours. Yes, that is right. And as Paul said, uh, if there's no resurrection, then our hope is in vain, because everything hinges on it. Right. Um, I, I'm reminded of a couple of bright young men who were sceptics uh, back a few years ago. They both went up to Oxford. Uh, one was Gilbert West, and uh, the other was Lord Littleton, the famous English journalist. And uh, these two men were agnostics, and they, they came to an agreement that Christianity must be discredited. And they agreed that to destroy it, two things were necessary. Uh, the first one was they must prove that Jesus never rose from the tomb, and the second was that they must prove that Saul of Tarsus was never converted to Christianity. So each of them took one of those two tasks, and uh, West resumed responsibility for the resurrection and his uh, accomplice, the other one. Now, they allowed themselves 12 months or more if necessary, and uh, at the end of that time, they both met again as planned, and the interesting thing was both of them were a little sheepish as they approached each other. Each one was apprehensive of what the other's reaction was going to be because when they compared notes, it was realized that they had both come independently to disturbing conclusions. Uh, West had found that the evidence pointed unmistakably to the fact that Jesus did rise from the dead, and this was good legal evidence. Littleton had found on examination that Saul of Tarsus did become a radically new man through his conversion to Christianity. And uh, both men had become in the process strong and devoted followers of Jesus. And they each experienced a remarkable change in, in each of their lives. And they said it had occurred through contact with the risen Messiah as they did their research. I think that's a wonderful testimony. It also means that you can approach, like Thomas, who went to India, and informed the Thomas Christians, uh, you can approach a belief with uh, skepticism. Skepticism is good if it's done honestly and methodically. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, there, there are many arguments against the, the resurrection of Jesus, and I think it's not going to hurt us, Bill, to look at some of these um, today and uh, more fully uh, on the 2nd of January. Because there are a lot of people out there whose faith, if, they, if they're not skeptics to start with, their faith has been shattered by going to university or by reading a lot of stuff on the internet that uh, poo hoos the whole fact of these events taking place. And I think it's good for us to strengthen our faith if we have faith uh, and to 
reassess our position if we don't have faith. Right. Exactly. So let's go through the. Now we're up in chapter again, thirty-five. Is it chapter thirty-five? Yes. Yeah. Now, what I like to to look at first is that if it was a hoax that established worldwide Christianity, if its central character, Jesus Christ, never rose from the dead, then what became of his body within three days after burial must be the world's most intriguing unsolved mystery and I think we all love mysteries and I think I, I remember the day I was in a backpackers hostel I can't remember what country I was in I think it was Australia and Melbourne discussing this very matter with a tourist from Sweden his name was Leif or Life and uh, he told me look I don't believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead it's history's biggest fraud so I said okay well you tell me about that well, he said the tale was inserted into the writings years later to glorify a dead hero. And now, so I looked at his face. He was dead serious about this. And so I, I asked him, Leif, the people involved in this fraud, as you call it, that sect known as Christians, when did that group of people actually come into being? Oh, he said, from my study, it happened during the reign of the Emperor Tiberius. Well, I had to agree with him. No contest on that. Uh, so that's a firmly established historical fact that Christians began in the in Emperor of Tiberius' reign. And he said, yeah, but the resurrection tale, that came later. That's something that evolved later on by these Christians. So I then asked him, look, wait, what was it that brought those Christians into existence in the reign of Tiberius? And he was stumped. And I, I put it to him, look, was it nothing less than the belief that Jesus had recently risen from the dead? Because even pagan writers and scholars attest that that is what they believed when they came into existence. Right. Now, all right, then how could the resurrection of the dead be a later invention of Christians if it was the very beginning of their belief, the very strength and the impetus of their faith that was the very reason why they were Christians. It was the very reason for their religion and their fervent hope. And uh, I, I put it to Leif that this was the cause and the beginning of Christian faith. It was the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Well, then Leif thought for a moment and he came back to me and he said, Oh, look, Jonathan, that story of Jesus was not written down till the 2nd, 3rd or 4th or century, a long time after the alleged event. Okay, well, I, I fortunately had with me something interesting uh, written by uh, Professor Albright. Uh, he wrote a, a uh, research paper called Recent Discoveries in Bible Lands, and Albright, by the way, was one of the foremost archaeologists of the Middle East, one of the world's foremost biblical archaeologists. And what he said is this, regardless of whatever else the Dead Sea Scrolls tell us, one thing is certain. We now know that none of the New Testament could have been written after AD 70. Wow. We That's can prove amazing. that too. Yeah, yeah, Dead Sea Scrolls closed the door on that, didn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Back in just a moment with Johnson Gray Before Us.com. Amazing ebook gifts to give this season. Welcome back, and I guess this is a, good, a great pre-Christmas show to talk about uh, the resurrection. Uh, that's the real point of Christmas. Uh, the ultimate gift is not giving to each other gifts. Uh, the gifts show, of course, that people care for each other, but the ultimate gift is is heaven, and heaven starts today. I tell people the resurrection of the soul is said to start the moment you become a believer, even if you're still faulting, and as it says, though a righteous man falls seven times, yea, though I will raise him up. So God is basically saying, when you start developing a relationship with me, even though you fall, I'll pick you up. Uh, he's saying that and ultimately, even when your physical body dies, I'll give you a resurrected body. So uh, people start heaven today. And they need to know that the real message of Christmas is the resurrection, isn't it? Yes, that's the heart of it. Because if he's not alive today, what is it all about? Yeah, so when you see Ebenezer Scrooge, it's not just taking a boat, Tiny Tim, so he can walk someday. It's so Tiny Tim will walk into heaven. 
it's uh, helping people, relatives, friends, and other people realize this temporal world is passing away, whether it passes away because of a coronal mass ejection in a solar storm where people become cannibals or passes away because the idiots and start a nuclear war or we have a super plague that eats away at the cortex of people with bioweapons developed in Russia in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s that can turn people into zombies or we have uh, the matrix literally developed because of economic chaos and they decide to literally clamp down the population or the globalists do get control and decide to reduce the population by 90% by whatever means including sterilization the Bible has always given us away in other words we're the people of the way would be the best description of believers it's, I think it's even better than the word Christian which is a word by the Emperor Domitian uh, people of the way mean we listen to God and we hear what he says and what his opinion on things is rather than so called false prophecy yes yes absolutely so now, uh, yeah, tell us more about this uh, great, great blessing that we're going to have uh, uh, and how this ties in with Christmas Okay. Now, uh, it, we, we could go through it, and, and we don't have to spend our time on this, but uh, we could if we if we ever had to, uh, go through our time looking at the age of uh, Matthew's Gospel, when it was written, Mark's Gospel, John's, um, Luke's, and, and Paul's writings, and we would find that um, the, there are copies of the Gospel of Mark that go down as early in the Dead Sea Scrolls, or well, portions of the, of the Gospel of Mark as early as 50 A.D., uh, less than 20 water. years after the after the resurrection. Yeah, that'll be like 18, 17 years, right? Yeah, that's right. And yeah. uh, then we and and then we have um, uh, records of, of people who uh, cited gospels as early as 37 AD and left their historical records behind, and and these records can be confirmed. So that's that's within the same decade as the events. Right. Uh, we won't go into that, but I can prove it. And in my book, Who's Playing Jesus Games, I, I concentrate on that particular aspect of it, Bill. Yeah, it's amazing but, you have this gift of academic ability to prove it, because we have a lot of skeptics out there. I call them Google geniuses. It'll make statements that are not by, by academic fact. And when you back it by academic fact, you prove that the Bible is a very unique book that literally transcends dimensions of time and space and literally came from the voice and the mind of the Most High God. It didn't come from the mind of prophets. It came from beyond their minds. They were simply scribes. That's right. They were under the control of the power of the Holy Spirit. No question right. about that. Right. And this means that the complete account was already written down while the eyewitnesses were still alive. And it's not something that the resurrection is not something that came to be accepted years later or was inserted later. At, from the very beginning, it was in the records, and it was put out at the time while people were in a position as eyewitnesses either to disprove it or to prove it. Now we have no historical. We have plenty of historical records from these decades of the first century, both Roman and Jewish and Christian. And the witness of enemies is usually considered to be among the most powerful. And we have not one record among the enemies who wrote against Christianity, Jewish or Roman, or any other, that disputes the fact that um, the resurrection took place. There is not one dispute of that from the early, early centuries. However, there's a lot of disputing against the Christians. But no one's denying and saying, well, there are eyewitnesses alive who can prove that this did not take place. Right. On the other hand, we do have eyewitnesses who have written and who say this event took place and it changed their lives and they were willing to die for it. And that's pretty good testimony. It is. Are we up to chapter 36 on who stole the body? <laughs> it sounds like you're moving right into that topic here before we have a follow-up show uh, right after Christmas. Yes. Yeah, well, I'm, I don't want to get into that today, but yes, we are sort of advancing ahead We're of We're moving in that direction. Okay, so let's continue on this topic. Okay. Now, at first the people had no written records of Jesus' resurrection, but rather they had personal attestation, living eyewitnesses, personal experiences of their own on which they based their faith. And it wasn't on just some records, but it was on what they had seen with their own eyes, and the records that followed were the result of that faith. So I guess what I'm trying to say, Bill, is that it was not written records that brought Christianity and its faith into existence. 
Paul himself was a one-time sceptic who was Saul, a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, very anti-Christian. But later on, he was able to say before King Agrippa, for the king himself knows of these things, that is, of the resurrection of the dead, before whom I speak freely, for I'm persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. So the resurrection of Jesus was a talked of, it was a discussed, it was a well-known event that swept the entirety of the Roman Empire in just a short time. Okay. Um, Just suppose it had been just a face-saving device on the part of a small bunch of fanatics. Tell me this. Do invented stories of that kind have the power to transform character? And do they have the power to transform men and women, and even boys and girls, to suffer indescribable horrors of persecution and to die martyrs' death? Now, if this thing was a deception, how do we explain the radiant joy on the faces of the sufferers? How do we explain the prayers on their lips as they ask for the forgiveness of those who were inflicting the pain? Because history shows that there was nothing, there was absolutely nothing, Bill, that could withstand their testimony. And and what they said turned the world upside down. And when they were challenged, they said, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. How do we account for that? That's the question. Uh, you take Peter, for example, on Pentecost Day, 50 days later. He didn't... I mean, he, he had been a coward. He had acted cowardly just a few days earlier, a few weeks earlier. But now he didn't speak to the crowd as a man who knew he was telling a lie. He spoke to thousands of people conscious in the same city where the events were alleged to have happened, conscious of the undeniable fact that Jesus Messiah had risen from the dead. And that was the main theme of his message. And no one could contradict him. No one attempted to deny it. Yeah, that was amazing, wasn't it? Yeah. By the way, that was the feast of uh, of the first first fruits as well. So it was actually a a Hebrew fulfillment of a Hebrew day, 50 days, or Pentecost, 50th, uh, were the omer, which is, means the first fruits of the of the harvest. So what it's basically saying is that yeah, Jesus was resurrected, but there's also resurrection of the dead. Uh, those who die physically, they're not gone. They're basically in a state where God will literally raise them up because He'll bring them into His memory, His mind, which literally allows them to live again. And not in a physical body, the same, but in a body that is transformed beyond that. It's not limited to time and space and the dimensional rules, but still, he was able to eat even. Remember, he he shared food with them after he was resurrected, so it wasn't like he was just like a ghost. Uh, He wasn't a zombie or a ghost. He was real. Absolutely. And this greatest of miracles was universally believed throughout the entire confines of the whole Christian movement. Um, And a powerful impact was felt because... The immediate followers of Jesus who had seen him publicly executed and publicly buried and had even brought, uh, brought spices and ointments and bandages to, uh, to embalm his body, as it were, uh, thinking that he would never rise again. These same people later walked and talked with him after his resurrection. And so this gripped them so that nothing could shake their faith. And they shook the world. So the ultimate uh, revelation to Ebenezer Scrooge wasn't just that he would be able to be a uh, patron and a protector of little Tiny Tim, but that Tiny Tim would not only walk physically, but walk spiritually with the Most High God, and that his whole family uh, would also understand that the real miracle is a miracle that a, a God that loves us so much that he will keep us alive forever, not just here on earth, which he will keep, but also in his kingdom. That's the bottom line. That's the real message of Christmas. Amazing. Coming up tomorrow, Harley Schlanger, the first hour, and a special interview because surprise for hour number three. Thank you, and have a wonderful Christmas, Jonathan Gray, as we come toward the Mayan scam.